It appears the Bitcoin ETF in the US is all but official, but is it actually a good thing for Bitcoin? In today's video, we break it all down. Let's jump in. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin pleb, and all around raging capitalist. And I'm filming this on Saturday the 16th. And so this video will go out Monday, uh, coinciding with the expected date of the uh, ProShares Bitcoin ETF, which we're going to break all of that down. Um, but in today's video, I want to talk about the type of ETF that this actually is. It's a future based uh, futures based ETF, which differs from a spot based ETF that would actually kind of uh, have exposure to the real underlying asset. And we're going to talk about what that actually means for Bitcoin. This is actually a really important topic, even if you have no interest whatsoever in kind of finance uh, and, and some of these topics. It's really important to understand because uh, this is going to be a big dynamic in the market going forward. Um, and indeed, there's perhaps some of you watching that uh, for whatever reason may be thinking of you know buying this thing. And so we'll dive into all of that uh, and my views on this topic. So you're not going to want to miss a thing. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends and brethren. It is nothing short than an absolute pleasure to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well, my friends. And I know there are many of you, about 80% of you watching, in fact, right this very moment, uh, are currently not subscribed. And so if you like this content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us in our merry gang in cyberspace, I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, whether it's wallet tutorials, DeFi on Bitcoin, Bitcoin Lightning Network, mining, running a node, news analysis such as this, and more. You want it, I cover it. But with all that out of the way, let's jump in and first sort of recap the lay of the land in terms of the kind of upcoming uh, ETF schedule. All right, so just as a quick recap, as we can see in this helpful kind of timeline, there are a ton of different SEC uh, deadlines for different decisions across a slew of different Bitcoin ETFs. Now, you'll notice the critical sort of note in the bottom left, which says futures based ETF applications. More on that in just a moment. Uh, but as you'll see, October 18th, so that should be the day this video comes out, uh, which is Monday, that is the sort of official uh, kind of response date for the ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF. Uh, and as we see from some of the different tweets that have gone out over the last uh, couple days, it was actually pretty funny, like, you know, everyone seemed to suddenly become a expert uh, on how ETFs are approved. Uh, so it's, uh, it's hard to decipher through the noise, but I think we can say with high degree of confidence that this is a go. Uh, you see Eric's note here just in, Bitcoin Futures ETF said to not face any uh, uh, opposition. Uh, so that was good. After this, you then saw the actual uh, you know, uh, Bloomberg uh, terminal started adding the, uh, the ticker symbol. Um, so B-I-T-O, uh, ProShares Bitcoin Strategy. Um, and again, we see clues all over the place, right? Read this, ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF is an exchange traded fund incorporated in the USA. ProShares Bitcoin strategy seeks capital appreciation. There can be no assurance that the fund will achieve its investment objective. The fund does not invest directly in Bitcoin. Okay, so another clue. We'll get to that, more on that in a moment. And then ultimately this went out kind of end of day Friday um, uh, on CNBC, you know, the ProShares uh, Bitcoin strategy ETF trade under the ticker BITO. Uh, now, the SEC has not formally approved this as of end of day Friday, and the agency, it says, may never make a formal declaration of approval for it, so it's odd and strange. The proposed date for the listing is Monday, according to the new filing, and so NASDAQ has like seemingly approved this, but there's this open question as to whether the SEC will have any final uh, comments on this. Um, but it, it doesn't seem that that will be the case. And so what does this all mean? We'll see what uh, officially happens next or this week uh, by the time this video goes out. 
Um, but it seems all things are a go. And, you know, initially you might think, oh, this is great news. Currently, at least in the U.S., uh, there's the Grayscale Trust, which is a very different investment vehicle and structure uh, that has a lot of kind of downsides, um, you know, uh, for for investors who are looking to uh, get long term, you know, exposure to this asset. And so a lot of folks think, well, an ETF will will help with that. But let's dive in now to the difference between a spot based ETF and a derivatives based ETF, such as a futures contract. So first and foremost, anytime you hear the word spot, that just means the underlying asset. So the spot price of Bitcoin would be the price of Bitcoin. Um, whereas a derivative of Bitcoin, such as a futures contract, uh, might have a different price that it's trading at. So let's define some terms like what is a futures contract. A futures contract is really nothing more than a contract between two trading parties that specify that basically say, one party has the uh, right to purchase an underlying asset at a specified price and a specified time in the future. And the counterparty to that trade um, has the obligation to sell the underlying asset to that individual at that agreed upon price at that agreed upon uh, time in the future. And so the history of, of futures contracts, think of think if you're like a farmer you know, and uh, you're selling, you know, produce to the market, you know, as we know, agricultural commodities can be uh, fairly volatile due to all sorts of different things, you know, demand factors, you have supply factors, uh, you know, drought can happen, all these sort of things. And so if you're a farmer and you want to lock in your income over the next, let's say, 12 months, what you could do is one of two things. Uh, you could wait and hope that the price of your eggs, let's say, uh, is you know the same or higher than the spot price of eggs now. Or you could enter into a futures contract to guarantee a certain price provided that someone on the other side is willing to accept that as well. And so that gives you the farmer um, more certainty that you can sell up you know at least a portion of your egg supply uh, in the future at a specified price. So this is a nice way to lock in uh, income if you're that farmer. And on the other side of that trade, why would someone else want to take that trade? Well, maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, you're a large grocery uh, chain. And so, you know, you're buying a bunch of uh, eggs from your farmer supplier there. Uh, and similarly, you may want to lock in uh, that price so that your costs are more predictable, etc. So there is like a very real kind of, um, you know, hedging use case here. Um, but I think for something like, you know, Bitcoin, uh, a lot of this is going to be either short term trading and hedging or speculation. Like these are really the two kind of use cases that are best served by a futures contract in the context of Bitcoin. And we can see a really crude diagram for what this might look like. You know, imagine there's some uh, underlying commodity or asset uh, that's tr currently trading for $50. And so again, if two parties enter into a futures contract, uh, maybe, the, maybe the futures price is also $50 if both parties believe that at some point in the future, the, the price is gonna remain relatively stable. And then if you're the buyer side of that contract, uh, you, you know, let's say that the price goes higher in the future at the time of expiration, uh, you can buy the underlying asset for the lower agreed upon price you previously just, uh, you know, locked in um, and vice versa. If the, um, you know, if the price goes down, you wouldn't be able to uh, buy that asset at the more favorable price. You would be locked into and obliged to settle the contract at the agreed upon price. And so there's this concept of convergence, right? As let's say it's a 12 month, you know, uh, futures contract, meaning it expires in 12 months. Um, there's also uh, perpetual futures that never expire, but you know we'll, we won't get into that in this video. Uh, but there's this idea of convergence, right? As you would kind of logically expect, the price of the futures contract should converge to the price of the underlying asset um, as you get closer and closer to maturity or expiration. Now, piggybacking off that concept, you have what are called normal versus inverted curves of futures contracts. And so as we can see in this diagram, 
uh, the normal blue line, um, you know, is basically one in which as you go further out in maturities, uh, you have higher futures prices. But you could just as easily have an inverted curve here where instead of the futures price going uh, up as you go further out into the future, uh, it could actually go down. And this has a, this has to do with a number of different factors. You know, futures pricing will take into account the spot price of the underlying asset, of course, but you've also got things like the risk-free rate of return, um, uh, things like storage costs. So imagine like barrel of oil that like has a real tangible cost to store this uh, commodity. Um, that is factored in to the futures contract price, you know, because depending on which counterparty you are, like you may have to bear that cost of storing the underlying asset, which should be reflected in uh, in the futures contract. Now, let's put this all together and talk about contango versus backwardation. And this essentially refers to the state of an asset's uh, futures curve and how that futures curve is converging with the expected underlying spot price. And so as we can see in this next view, contango is basically a situation in which the futures contract price is higher than the spot price or the expected spot price of the underlying asset. And so what that means is by definition, as you get closer to the delivery date, uh, the, the price of that futures contract is actually going down. So let that sink in. Um, conversely, for no what's called backwardation or normal backwardation, it's the opposite. If the futures contract is trading at a lower price than the underlying uh, you know, spot price, by definition, that futures price will increase as we get closer to the delivery date. And there's a huge implication for this when you also factor in what is called the roll yield or the roll return, which has to do with how traders and speculators interact with futures contracts um, in the sense that as they get close to expiration and sort of settlement, they'll do what's called a rollover of that futures contract. So they will sort of, um, you know, they might sell the current contract that they have and buy a new contract with the longer maturity to kind of uh, reestablish the original risk position that they had in the first place. So I know it's a lot of gibberish, especially if you know, you're kind of new to these concepts, but let's take a look at what the implications of this are. So Lynn Alden provides this excellent example, uh, as always, showing the, uh, this goes back, you know, at least more than five years, five, six, seven years-ish. And this is showing in the purple line, the crude oil spot price versus in the orange line, this is a futures-based ETF. Um, I think it's, the ticker is USO, if I am correct. And so what you can see is that like the futures-based ETF is nowhere close to the return uh, of the underlying spot price. And so you're like, whoa, why on earth would there be such a big divergence? And it has to do with this roll yield or roll return dynamic. And so this guy, Joe Orsini, breaks, down, uh, breaks this down for us. It turns out that Bitcoin futures have traded in uh, contango for the most part, meaning the futures price is higher than the current spot price. And you may think, well, isn't this just, doesn't this just mean that like traders expect the price to go up? And it's not, shouldn't necessarily be the case that contango, that Bitcoin tra futures trade in contango. Um, but there may be factors like the, f the fact that a big portion of the total demand in the market uh, can sort of only purchase through these more traditional means as opposed to buying like actual Bitcoin and putting that on their balance sheet. That may be one reason that we see contango uh, for the most part in the Bitcoin futures market. Uh, because for example, you don't have you don't have storage costs in the same way as you have storage costs for oil. Although I suppose again, institutions are going to be paying some custodian to, hold their 
their Bitcoin. And so I guess thinking through this out loud, you know, that's maybe not all that different from um, from gold, like paying a you know bank to put your gold and secure your gold in a vault. You know, that has a couple, you know, uh, percentage points of cost on an annualized basis. And so may, maybe that is the sort of underlying reason. Regardless, the point is Bitcoin futures typically trade in contango. And so that means that there is this potential for a suppression in the futures price uh, due to this kind of rollover mechanic. And so as Joe explains, here's how futures-based ETFs work. Before contract expiration, ETFs must sell first month futures and purchase second and further out futures to not receive physical or cash delivery. We'll talk about that concept in a moment. Uh, so when the curve is in contango, futures-based ETFs sell cheaper futures and purchase more expensive futures each month. This difference is called roll return, and this number is negative when the futures curve is in contango because of that dynamic that we saw, right? By definition, as we converge on the maturity date, the price of a futures-based uh, ETF in contango is going to go down. But how much does this affect underlying performance of the ETF? Uh, he's using the same sort of uh, comparison that Lynn Alden was just looking at. Let's look at the USO ETF and look at five-year total returns. Spot crude index plus 61%. First month crude futures manually rolled each month plus 31%. However, if you were to just like buy and hold USO, negative 38%. You're thinking, how could this be? And so Joe says, yes, you've read that right. Even though spot crude is up 61%, uh, a futures-based ETF is down negative 38%. Note that the crude futures curve has only been in contango half of the time. Um, but as he explains, the damage was done from the most recent uh, contango that stretched for the uh, first century 2020. Uh, and he goes into some additional details there. And so he concludes, you know, in just over one year, a futures-based ETF underperformed spot by a staggering 55%. And then even though the futures switched to backwardation the, mo most recently in 2021, uh, you know, the damage was already done, right? And so conclusion, futures-based ETFs are for intraday trading, not long-term investing. Own Bitcoin directly. I couldn't agree more with what Joe is saying. The punchline of this is that this is a horrible way uh, to, <laughs> to invest in Bitcoin, right? And as you've heard me say on the channel many times, I think of Bitcoin much more as a savings technology rather than you know investing. But nonetheless, this is an absolutely disastrous way to hodl Bitcoin for the long term. Now, again, I would suspect most of you watching this are probably like, well, yeah, I wouldn't dream of investing in this crap, you know, when I know how to uh, you know buy the underlying asset and and secure it. Uh, and hold in, in custody. I suspect that's true for most of you. Uh, but some of you, maybe that's not the case. Maybe this is your first kind of entry into the Bitcoin market. And so this is an absolutely crucial distinction to be aware of. Maybe some of you have business entities that you're kind of like, hey, I would love to stack some Bitcoin on my business's uh, balance sheet, but like, argh, like, I'm not really, you know, what are the kind of ramifications of that? Or maybe you have investors that don't support that. Uh, but would support a more traditional, you know, ETF-based way to do that. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why people might be thinking of this as a uh, as a way to invest in Bitcoin. Now, one very logical follow-up question you might ask is, okay, Ian, that's 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 good to know. But like, what about you know? Surely there's going to be a spot-based, uh, you know, ETF in the future. And I think you're right. In fact, Jacoby Asset Management, as we can see here, um, received approval to launch uh, the world's first, as far as I'm aware, what they call Tier 1 Bitcoin ETF or a spot-based Bitcoin ETF. Uh, interestingly enough, the custody, as you can see, is provided by Fidelity Digital Assets. So I wonder if it's just a matter of time before Fidelity does uh, uh, or, or before uh, an entity with Fidelity as their custodian does something like this in the U.S., 
Uh, this is being, um, the jurisdiction here is Guernsey. Guernsey is kind of uh, a uh, territory, I guess. Um, but that's the jurisdiction this is being sort of launched through. And this will be listed on the CBOE Europe. So it does exist. Uh, this will be interesting to watch as it gets launched and see what interest there is for probably particularly European investors. Uh, there also is a grayscale that is dead set on transitioning their trust structure to a spot-based Bitcoin ETF. Um, and a lot of folks assumed that this would always happen. Uh, Barry Silbert, who leads uh, grayscale, uh, has talked about this a number of times. The, the reason that they are now filing this or planning to file it essentially next week is because of the green light that we have presumably gotten for a futures-based ETF. So Grayscale is going to at least initiate the process, um, which will take, as this says, you know, there's a 75-day review period. Um, but, uh, but, but I think that is perhaps the silver lining here. Like, the futures-based ETF uh, is this kind of like bastardized Frankenstein thing uh, that's probably best for you know short-term traders and not much else. But it could pave the way for a spot-based ETF. Time will, of course, tell. Now, the final thing I want to mention is, um, you know, at this point, it's like, okay, we get it. This futures-based ETF is, uh, is a horrible, awful, disastrous way to, um, uh, to buy. It, it doesn't even matter that it's in Contango, right? Like, you know, even if it's switched to backwardation and uh, the, like, you want to hold Bitcoin. You want to hodl and take custody of your own Bitcoin. If you don't, you are just not gonna make it and you haven't been paying attention at all. Gotta bring out the tough love here. Um, but there's also this additional question. If you're like, okay, yeah, I would never dream of you know investing in, in that crap. Uh, there's still a question of like, well, what impact will this have on the market? And a lot of people will think, oh, this, this is surely very bullish for Bitcoin because you're gonna all of a sudden have a ton of additional demand uh, but as we saw, like the ProShares ETF isn't even going to be uh, trading underlying Bitcoin. And so there's this concept of physical versus cash settlement. Physical settlement means if I'm that farmer, going back to our egg example, like once, the, once we get to the uh, maturation of the contract and the expiration of the contract, like I have to settle that. I have to send the eggs to the other side of the trade. Uh, and similarly, the other side of the trade has to you know, pay me for the eggs. That's what's called physical settlement. Like the, the thing is physically you know, being transferred. Um, but that's not even what's happening in this case. The, this is what's called a cash settled ETF. And so once you get to expiration, it's not even the case that you're buying uh, you know, Bitcoin, it's being settled in cash. So I, I certainly think this will have a short term, uh, probably, well, let me say this. I think we'll probably see sell the news, which, you know, we saw with the El Salvador, uh, announcement, um, you know, hodlers got a fat red 10 K, you know, negative <laughs> red candle, uh, after El Salvador. And so like, who knows if something similar will happen here, especially given the uh, pretty face melting, you know, price action we've seen over the last few days. Nonetheless, that's that's noise, right? And so hodl on, my friends. Even if we see some sell the news, I think even if that does happen and we see one more shakeout, it is going to be up only from there for the rest of the year and perhaps beyond. And so that could happen in the very very short term. And then as this, you know, as these ETFs uh, get approved and, and start trading. Uh, I do think that will bring positive momentum to Bitcoin uh, in, in the short term. But over the long term, all this is, make no mistake, this is not the SEC saying, oh, we want to protect people. We want to protect consumers and protect investors. This is simply a tool to suppress and stifle the price of Bitcoin. This is what's happened uh, to gold over you know, the last few decades, um, they have masterfully suppressed gold through all these kind of derivative and paper claims of it. Um, the way to think about it is this, if I'm, you know, there's, 
Think of the big pool of demand, global demand for the asset. Um, a portion of that demand doesn't actually care about the asset itself. This is just a fact. Uh, they care about exposure to the asset and potentially profiting off of you know movements in the asset's price, but they could care less about like owning and custody you know custodying uh, Bitcoin. You know they're just in it for fiat gains. And so a portion of that total demand, which might now be trading spot Bitcoin, could go to uh, to go could go into this futures based uh, paper claim on Bitcoin. And so for the same single Bitcoin, the more paper claims or paper derivatives you spin around that, you basically have a soaking up of demand. And so this has the effect of suppressing price relative to what it would be otherwise if the only way to buy the asset is to buy the underlying asset. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's go ahead now, I know we've covered a lot, and wrap this video up. All right, my friends, there you have it. Uh, we dug into some finance today, so you know we like to keep it fresh. Uh, but I think this is really topical. And so to recap, the critical conclusions we discuss are that one, in terms of a specific investment vehicle, savings vehicle, whatever, a futures-based ETF uh, is a horrible, terrible idea. You do not want to do this um, unless you're a, you know, short-term trader and if you are i'm not sure why you're watching my uh my channel uh although like welcome either way uh but that's kind of point one and then point two over the long run make no mistake this will have a suppressing effect on bitcoin this gives a tool to institutions whose main weapon is cash uh to influence the price of bitcoin so this is uh this is Net net, in my view, a bad thing for Bitcoin. Uh, at the same time, as we know, Honey Badger doesn't really care at the end of the day. Um, I think this will be harder to do and suppress than gold. Uh, but make no mistake, that is the purpose and reason for this. That is the reason why this is going to get approved and is going to start uh, is because it gives regulators and banks and big institutions a way to you know, keep the lid on Bitcoin as much as they possibly can, but they will lose in the end, as we know. But we'll go ahead and leave this video here. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, leave your comments down below with questions you might have, uh, related topics you'd like to see in future videos. I really do take that into account when making the schedule for the channel. But I hope you found this valuable and useful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, comment down below with your thoughts. Uh, but for now, we'll go ahead and leave this video here. As always, my friends, every single sat counts, especially when you're taking self-custody of it and of the underlying asset. And until next time, I'll see you then.